As we have seen, you can linearize a dynamical system at an equilibrium, and that is going to be the key to our first major result, the stability criterion for equilibria. Consider what we've just done. Given an equilibrium A in a dynamical system, either continuous or discrete time, if you take a small perturbation H and you look at how that evolves over time, then the linearized dynamics gives that to you. In continuous time, it's dh equals lambda h. In discrete time, it's eh equals lambda h, where lambda is the derivative of the right-hand side, df dx, evaluated at the equilibrium A. Now, we know the explicit solutions to these linear dynamics. In continuous time, it's e to the lambda t times h naught. In discrete time, it's lambda to the n h naught. So that tells us how perturbations grow or shrink over time, continuous or discrete. So given that, the stability criterion is as follows. An equilibrium, x equals a, for a continuous time dynamical system, dx equals f of x, is a stable equilibrium if the derivative of f with respect to x at a is negative. Why? When lambda is negative, then e to the lambda t is going to zero. That means nearby solutions converge to that stable equilibrium. On the other hand, what happens if that derivative is zero? Then you have a degenerate equilibrium. The stability criterion fails. You can't tell stable, unstable, I don't know. Linearization is not enough to predict. If, however, your derivative at the equilibrium is positive, then you have an unstable equilibrium. Why? Because e to the lambda t is growing exponentially when lambda is positive. Okay, that's the continuous time stability criterion. The discrete time stability criterion is very similar. If you have an equilibrium to ex equals f of x, then it is either stable or degenerate or unstable, depending on whether the derivative of the right-hand side at the equilibrium is less than 1 or equal to 1 or greater than 1, respectively. Ooh, wait a minute. There's a little subtlety here involving the absolute value. What we really care about is whether that derivative in absolute value is less than 1, equal to 1, or greater than 1. And again, think back to what we have shown. A perturbation, hn, grows like lambda to the n. So if lambda is less than 1 in absolute value, it's shrinking to 0, stable. If lambda is bigger than 1 in absolute value, then lambda to the n is growing exponentially, unstable. Now, what I want you to focus on is the differences between these two. How in continuous time, it depends on whether it's positive or negative. In discrete time, whether it's bigger than 1 or less than 1 in absolute value. Now, that's kind of strange. I mean, why is there a difference in the stability criteria for discrete versus continuous time? Why are these differences the way they are? Now, we've said before that one of the really important ideas that we want to get at is the relationship between continuous and discrete time dynamics. Do you remember? Do you remember what we showed earlier about the discrete versus continuous time evolution operators? That is, the differentiation operator, D, and the shift operator, E. That's right. Now I remember the shift operator, E, is the exponential of the differentiation operator, D. Now what does that have to do with the stability criterion? What happens if you take the continuous time stability criterion and you exponentiate it? What happens if you exponentiate a negative number? Hmm, you get something that's less than 1. What happens if you exponentiate a positive number? You get something that's bigger than 1. And of course, the exponential of 0 is precisely 1. Hmm, that's interesting. Does that explain everything? Well, maybe not. I don't know. I mean, what about that absolute value? That doesn't really seem to fit into this picture, does it? I don't know. It's still a little unclear. This has an element of truth to it, but this is a story that is to be continued. Remember what we have done. The stability criterion is going to guide so much of our thinking from here on out. 
you're really going to want to memorize this stability criterion right away. Now, for the moment, the differences between the continuous and discrete time stability criteria are a little bit strange. They're important. We can use what we know about the differentiation operator and the shift operator to start making sense of it, but eventually we'll fill in this story more completely.